Thank you. And by the way, for those who came late, uh, if you scan your email or you leave it with us, we're not only giving you a copy of this book, but the slides. So if you would like us to email you the slides, please make sure that either our intern scans you or I scan you, or I've got some pages uh, where you can fill in your email and we will make sure we send you the slides. Uh, so I, I just uh, I, I just want to introduce briefly uh, uh, Professor Itzik Ben Israel, who's the mastermind behold, uh, behind this entire thing, former military general, and now heads the Cyber um, uh, Institute here at Tel Aviv University. Thanks for having us. Thank you. I don't know what Omer referred to by saying mastermind of, not of GDPR, but of the cyber activity here. I would like to welcome you coming to Tel Aviv University. It's the first event. This is one of three events that started simultaneously in this uh, cyber week. We are going to have something like 60 events like this, all over 8,000 people. 2,000 coming from abroad, 60, uh, 85 countries, and I hope that you will find other aspects of cybersecurity, which are not only uh, the new, relatively new GDPR. And, and uh, thank you for coming, and still save some time for enjoying Tel Aviv. We are working on the weather, it's too hot, but perhaps with you know, this new cyber technology, we can do something. And, and uh, uh, I hope to see you again. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry that in some cases we don't give you the definitive legal answer. It's a complicated statute. Um, one of the things, however, uh, I think that I hope we can accomplish is to make sure we give you the issues that are gonna be framed to help you understand that some of these issues are not brand new and so there's a history of data protection practice, sometimes around the same exact language that was in the previous directive. And so as the regulators make their decisions on some of the nuanced issues, they're not inventing it all from whole cloth. Um, Gabriella did a report um, uh, uh, with uh, our friends at um, uh, Adnimity looking at legitimate interest. So a lot of people are looking at legitimate interest for the first time and saying, oh wow, what does it mean? Balancing test, blah, blah, blah. It's been in the law for a very long time. Regulators have already taken many actions, given guidance. Um, uh, so what Gabriela and uh, uh, her team did is we went through 40, 50 different cases, summarized them for you, and when you sign up for our email, I will send you a copy of her report. We really want your email. No, but the reason I think, but the reason I mentioned it uh, in particular though is, um, please don't think this was just birthed and it's brand new. We're asking questions that European data protection lawyers have dealt with for many years. Maybe the stakes weren't so high, maybe uh, the global scope wasn't so serious, but if you simply read the statute, as I see a lot of people doing on the various listservs, you will fail. There are court cases that give real structure to this, and there is many years of enforcement history, right? So imagine in any other area where you're giving guidance, if you're just reading the statute and you don't know any of the context around it. And too much we do that with the GDPR because we focus on GDPR, but it sits in a legal environment. Okay, so one uh, key point. Um, 
If there's one thing uh, I would also like to suggest uh, for those of you who are really looking to get deeper, uh, in addition to reading Gabriela's report on legitimate interest, um, Bird and Bird has a phenomenal uh, uh, guide to the GDPR that incorporates a lot of guidance. The UK ICO has a guide that continues to update every time there's a new uh, guidance from the European Data Protection Board. They layer it in. Those are the two sort of shortcuts. The UK ICO one now I think is almost 300 pages, so maybe it's not such a shortcut anymore. Um, and then the third thing, for those of you who really want to uh, go even deeper, the uh, European Human Rights Agency put out a book. It's free, I think, uh, via uh, PDF, or you can order the book. And it traces the background and the history through the courts, through the uh, Lisbon Treaty. And frankly, if you're going to be a sophisticated you know, advisor on this, you need to understand how it fits into that broader context. So those would be, you know, if I was saying to somebody, you're starting fresh, read the Human uh, uh, Rights Agency report, read Gabriela's legitimate interest, the UK ICO guidance has been enormously useful, and the Bird and Bird document. OK, I'm delighted to introduce uh, directly uh, from Brussels, Dr. Karolina Mozesowicz. Um, uh, Karolina is the deputy head of the unit of data protection at the European Commission. Um, she played a role in the GDPR. She plays a role in the uh, monitoring the member state uh, implementations of uh, GDPR. Uh, she plays a role in helping provide uh, some of the guidance the Commission puts out. What else is on your very busy package of activities uh, besides those things? Spreading the good news. And helps educate <laughs> and share um, uh, the, um, uh, the views of the uh, Commission. Uh, Gabriela, you already met. Uh, so let me turn to these uh, folks and we're going to look at the legal basis for processing and the individual rights. Uh, Gabriela, are you kicking off first? Um, so this is um, a continuation of the discussion we had earlier uh, with Gabe and Omer. Uh, we're going to talk about the conditions under which you can process personal data, and then we're going to talk about the individual rights that data subjects have. So data subjects are the persons whose data, whose personal data you're processing. Um, What's very important to mention with regard to data protection in the EU is that data protection is actually protected as a fundamental right uh, in the EU. It's provided for in Article 8 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and this is one of the reasons why courts tend to apply the wide interpretation of concepts like personal data, uh, and this is one of the reasons why the courts tend to reinforce the right um, to the benefit of the person rather than interpret and apply it uh, more restrictively to the person. Um, we have in this uh, constitutional level uh, right, we have a lot of um, indications about the detailed rules in the GDPR. So, um, I already covered paragraph one. Everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. Because we have that everyone there, uh, this also allows for personal data to protect like American persons, like that professor uh, mentioned earlier, that wants to reinforce his rights with regard to how Cambridge Analytica, a UK-based company, processed his data. So everyone, you don't have to be European. Everyone is protected if the other conditions also apply territorial and material. Then the second paragraph states that such data, personal data, must be processed fairly for specified purposes. So this covers, for instance, Article 5 of the GDPR. We won't go into detail uh, here. We'll talk a bit uh, um, about it um, perhaps later on. And then the second paragraph also says that uh, data must be processed fairly specified for specified purposes and on the basis of the consent of the person or some other legitimate basis laid down by law. Again, this is in the charter itself. This covers Article 6 of the GDPR and it requires that you always have to have a lawful ground to be able to process personal data. Uh, it may be consent, or it may be one of the other lawful bases provided by law. The general law is 
in Article 6 of the GDPR. You will have there all the lawful grounds enumerated, and this is what we are going to talk about uh, now. Um, then the last part of Article um, 8, Paragraph 2 says that everyone has the right of access to their own data uh, and the right to have it rectified. So we have two of the individual rights provided in the Charter, but you will see that the GDPR provides for an entire set of rights, including erasure, including data portability, and we'll talk about all of these rights uh, in this um, session. Uh, then finally, uh, the Charter talks about compliance with these rules and that compliance has to be subject to control by an independent authority. And this is why we have data protection authorities, uh, just like you have here uh, in, in Israel. Um, so, talking about lawful basis for processing, uh, the rule um, so the principle of lawfulness, it's very important, as we saw in the Charter. You, ha you have, when you have personal data and you want to do something with it, even store it, as we uh, talked earlier, so any kind of processing, you always have to have a lawful ground. Um, and what's very important in the GDPR is that uh, we have the principle of accountability uh, which requires that controller, the controller is responsible for and must be able to demonstrate compliance with all the rules uh, in Article 5, Paragraph 1, which include the rule on lawfulness. What this means in practice is that the controller and not the processor will be responsible to have a lawful ground in practice, for instance, consent or legitimate interest, and the controller is also responsible to document that lawful ground. So if you have a legitimate interest as lawful ground, uh, there is some documentation and some thought that needs to go into that, and we'll talk about that documentation uh, soon. Um, Perfect. So for me, for I would think that it's very important that what you take from this lecture today is that EU is by no means consent-focused or consent-centric. Uh, we have this all legal basis and they have an equal validity. Our court doesn't say consent is better than anything else. Indeed, the rights of data, uh, of data subject are slightly different dependent on which legal basis is used and what can be done with the data gathered initially on one of the legal basis. And here I'm touching upon the issue of further processing, but this is something that I will come a little bit later to. So, Gabriela just explained different legal bases. Again, we are not consent focused. We have this six legal bases. They are all equally, um, um, equally justifying the processing operations undertaken by you. And the legitimate interest one gives organizations a lot of flexibility. Well. Uh, so you have here all the six of them. I didn't get to. I didn't, I didn't get to mention all of them. Okay. Six. So um, I, I think it's it's really we will go through each and every. Therefore, I was not yeah. mentioning them now. But you will see consent, contract, and here very interesting for you to know the Article 29 Working Party will maybe issue something concerning the use of a contract in the online area. Then we have. Um, compliance with legal obligations. So if a law imposes of a, on, a, on a controller, on an organization, an obligation to process data for specific purposes, when it's necessary to protect vital interests, when it's a public authority performing its tasks, and finally the legitimate interest. And now I will come to the consent. And we will explain. you. Another important issue, there is no groundbreaking change in this respect. The legal basis existed already in the EU before, where the changes are coming is here on the consent, streamlining and clarification. We had problems with, with fragmentation within the EU because different member states interpreted differently what is consent. Now you see the adjectives indicated here on the slide freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. It all sounds nice, but these adjectives bring in a lot of um, consequences. Let me start with 
freely given. Freely given, it's non-conditional. It means this consent cannot be linked to a contract, for example, in a way that the contract will be performed only if somebody gives also a consent to something else. And here, probably you all think, cookie walls and a uh, different kind of, of um, interlinking between contract and consent we see in internet. It's what I just mentioned, Article 29 Working Party is working on it. Some of the issues I will cover explaining more consent and contract. Well, this conditionality was already explained to some extent in the um, guidelines issued on the consent, which should be read together with the previous guidelines. Article 29 Working Party, now the board, and bank before Article 29 Working Party issued on the consent. The whole question is, when can we really have validly situation, because the regulation does not say it's completely prohibited, it just indicates it's, it's more a presumption that when there is such a conditionality, probably it's, uh, the consent will not be freely given and therefore not valid in the sense of the GDPR. But, um, so how does Article 20 in the board, I'm sorry, go around it? What they explain is, obviously, there will be some situations when there will be necessary to have something additional in order to be able to provide a contract. And it's mainly in the situation when the explicit consent in the sense of Article 9 is needed. I'm again here reaching a little bit in for, uh, forward to what we will be explaining, because this legal basis we just uh, uh, presented on the slide before apply to all personal data. But we have also the data of special category, so-called sensitive data, and in order to be able to process such kind of data, like um, political views, religious beliefs, uh, uh, sexual orientation, um, uh, health data, in order to be able to process such a data, additional conditions are needed, which are stemming from Article 9. Now, one of these additional conditions is explicit consent. Because your question can be, okay, I'm here, um, you know, like um, providing a service, I'm a um, uh, um, travel agency, and I want to provide a specific service to somebody who has maybe a, a health condition. Or I just want to adjust the, uh, uh, you know, um, the food, the menu to uh, dietary restrictions based or religious beliefs or health issues. Now, the main part of the processing, your, uh, your, your travel agency uh, activities, this you will cover with the contract. But in order to be able to process this health data, what are my dietary restrictions because of the health, I have diabetes, or because of um, what my dietary restrictions, because I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish, I need kosher. All of this you will need to process on the basis of explicit consent. Now, if you have this kind of, let's put it, conditionality, if you, in such a situation, link contract with the consent, it's acceptable. This is at least what, uh, what, what the board, what the European Data Protection Boards seems to indicate in their guidelines. Now, a part of this, of this possibility of freedom not linking to something else within the consent, in this element of, of freedom of, uh, of consent being freely given, goes to uh, together the fact that when I withdraw the consent, I will not have a detriment because then <laughs> If I have a detriment, then my choice is not so free. Probably it will have quite some impact on a lot of businesses in deciding um, um, how to offer maybe additional uh, services on frills based on this, what was being given now on the basis of consent and, and so on. So, but here the condition is there can be no detriment, no negative consequence for the data subject if the consent is withdrawn 
of course, it goes with an objective assessment. Was it necessary to provide this? Uh, I cannot provide you anymore the, the service. Okay, I cannot do something because I cannot process your data anymore. I do not have the legal basis. An important element in, again, freely given and coming already to the element of specific, is the granul granularity, the specificness of the consent. It cannot be broad, going again, uh, uh, you know, like covering very different kind of, uh, of processing operations. Here we have a small exception for, for in, in the health uh, sector, for, for, health, uh, for research, I would put it more. But uh, as far as very normal specific consent is, uh, is concerned, it must be as specific as possible. Then, um, uh, so as granular as possible. Um, what does it mean that the consent needs to be informed? The board already provided a small list, and here um, it, it says that the identity of the, pros, of the uh, controller or, or needs to be indicated, the, po the purpose of the processing, the possibility to withdraw the consent, the question or if there is profiling, automated decision-making process, including profiling going on on the basis of consent, this should be indicated, and if it's used for transferred also. So only this four elements. Already here we see that the information in order to, which you need to provide in order to have a valid consent, it's not exactly the same you need to provide in order to fulfill your obligations under Article 13 and 14. We will come to it, these are transparency rights. There is a difference between the two. It's much less, yeah? It's much less you just need to say who you are, what do you process it for that somebody can withdraw it and whether you are going to profile somebody on the basis of it, to have it even more than profiling, to have an automated decision-making process on the basis of this concept. On this so, point, question? Yeah. Just, uh, if you could please uh, elaborate a bit or give us an indication about the exception you mentioned about the health research It's recital 35, if I'm not mistaken, of the um, of the uh, regulation, oh, 33, I'm sorry. So, it is often not possible to fully identify the purpose of personal data processing for scientific research purposes at the time of data collection. Therefore, data subjects should be allowed to give their consent to certain areas of scientific research when in keeping with a recognized ethical standards for scientific research. So this is a little bit broader. This is an exception. Yeah? Yep. Well, Let's quickly squeeze in a few, maybe. Yeah. Uh, no. You need to have, if there are separate processing operations within this app, then they should ask for specific, uh, for, for more specific consents. But we wouldn't go as far as to say that we oblige each and every app provider to give you only, to always provide the possibility to have only the core and something else. They have a freedom to, to uh, the, the organizations have a freedom to conceive the service in the way they would like to offer it. If it's objectively necessary to have your consent in order to have this, uh, this data while providing the, 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 
while providing the service, then I would say let's not go that far as to cut it off. It's a little bit different in the situation when we have a contract and consents going, on, going in uh, parallel. Like for, some, for example, the core is on the basis of the contract and additional uh, parts of the uh, thing are going on the basis of a consent then it needs to be very specific and not interlinked. Let's yeah. give an example of where the, we'll probably see some guidance very soon because of the complaints filed against some of the big tech companies. So Facebook is um, uh, collecting your permission on the basis of contract. If you re-approved recently, uh, and Facebook says, our business is providing a social network and personalized advertising. This is our mission, and as a result, we don't give you any choices to stop having targeted ads. Sensitive data and so forth, you know, separate. So already we see some complaints filed saying, no, 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 no. That is too much to bundle into the contract. You need to give some choices uh, about this. And Facebook says, no, this is our core business model. So exactly how broad you can say my business model is all these other things, maybe marketing and advertising and things that are removed are essential to operating your business. Maybe you can do less marketing advertising. So this is probably where we'll see some definition. Exactly. What is very important that on whichever legal basis and contract to which I will come, you cannot ask for more than objectively necessary in order to provide something. So, for example, all these apps that are asking us access to I don't know what, although it's not really what this app is about, there it goes too far. So, but what, what I understand you're saying is that it's for the company that provides the app to find what is necessary for the operation of the business, right? It's well, it's an objective assessment. There are different models that can be applied on the same uh, application, and that is the only part of so, I just want to add something. So, the company is primary; it, it's responsible to define their purpose, their scope of activity. So that's, and then the necessity part of it. It's an objective uh, criterion. So the company defines what is their business model, what's the purpose, must be transparent about the, that purpose, and we'll talk about transparency obligations um, soon. And then uh, the, what data is necessary to achieve that, that's, that should be a, an objective uh, test, uh, actually. Yeah, it should be an objective test, and is also one in the contract, um, which is, the unambiguous, because it was the last element which I was missing from the last time, it, might, it must be a clear affirmative action. It cannot be a predict box, it cannot be uh, something, it cannot be just observed, it cannot be um, implied more than observed. It needs to be something that it's given actively, clearly, and the person giving it needs to be cautious of it. Um, and now we are in the... Contract. Contract. Exactly. So here it covers both pre-contractual relationships and the contract itself. What we already issued, that we already tackled, it's objectively necessary. With all the contractual freedom that there is, it cannot be inflated so as to cover uh, other elements which are not objectively necessary in order to provide the service. If I order a dress over internet, my political views or my, um, I don't know, my shoe size is not necessary, yeah? I ordered a dress. What is necessary in order to provide me with, to fulfill the contract is my name, my address, um, clarification of the payment method. So in the case I decide to pay by the credit card, the credit card number and the size point, but nothing a part of it. If it goes beyond, Another legal basis needs to be used. Consent, never linked, and what we uh, just explained. 
Sorry. Yeah. Can, can I just uh, throw in a question about the uh, consent? And uh, but, but what we typically see are the banners now, right? And uh, I, I just, I'm just wondering if you have the banner saying we are going to collect data from cookies, social plugins, plugins, whatever, and it just has an I accept, or you c there is no no there. There is a yes, and there is like a close out, and just continue you know, doing your business. Is that consent? For me, if then, if you are not saying yes and they don't do it, it's okay. Because then for me, it's clear that you agree to it in the moment that you say yes. So the existence of the, existence of the box, no, I don't think it's necessary. Because in the moment you say, you do not say yes, you automatically say no. There can be no gray zone in there. You need to have a clear legal basis and consent needs to be given by clear affirmative action. Non-action, not saying yes, is not, is not an unambiguous expression of your wishes. But let me observe that yeah. as many of you are monitoring how websites are actually interpreting this, uh, we are seeing a range of views. So uh, Xing, uh, leading German social network, I see no cookie banner, there's an explanation of targeting and behavioral advertising. And many German publishers seem to be taking the view that they don't actually even need any banner or pop-up. Uh, the regulators there have given different guidance and the legal community is saying, no, we think we're right. Um, if you go to the Keneal website, you go to the EDPS website, you'll see, again, they're only doing analytics, they're not doing very robust things. Uh, you'll see uh, a banner, but if I continue browsing, I'm accepting uh, the limited use of privacy-friendly cookies. Um, the IAB, the, uh, I will talk more in the ad tech uh, discussion later, uh, you'll see many implementations where clearly, and then the Keneal previously was accepting this, and apparently they seem to be comfortable. Again, we'll, we'll see how this evolves. Um, uh, they seem to be comfortable with if I have a clear banner, and it says, when you click on any link or you continue clicking through the pages, you have agreed to what we've just told you in the banner. Um, my understanding, and maybe we'll clarify for those of you who are coming tomorrow with the, the Keneal representatives who are speaking, their complaint is, what is it that you are agreeing to? We maybe are comfortable that you click on the page that says, yeah, you agree. What did you just agree to? If you didn't see all the different uh, companies that data is being provided to, that's our problem there. So I think you're seeing some diversity in interpretation here. Well, I, I think that in this respect, maybe the transparency guidelines um, will help and uh, should have helped because they are already adopted. But, and coming back to the question you posed, Omar, the, the accountability principle. Responsibility is always to show the compliance, to show that I had a valid consent on the controller. So whoever will go ahead with processing without having a clear affirmative action, without the, having the click on yes, I would say it's a it's a so to be situation. clear, the CNIL yeah. website does exactly that. But it's it very has granular. It a banner saying if you continue browsing this website, you are agreeing. There is also a button that says, yes, I agree. But you know, I didn't check their website to see what they're collecting. But um, I did. They're using Pewik, the privacy-friendly, doesn't share you know, third-party data back. So again, whether the nuance is the good distinction there. Uh, let me let Gabriella answer and then go to the gentleman and then we'll go through because we have uh, a few more bases that we better cover. Yeah. Uh, I, I will just, about the CNIL banner, I would just want to add that you have the option to consent, to say oh, yes, and the other option is personalized. If you click on personalize, you will have about six, seven different processing activities with a button close uh, next to each of them, and you can choose to allow or not allow uh, collection of data for uh, a set of very different purposes that are all enumerated. So it's it's really granular and it but gives if you, you choice. Click on nothing, you, yeah. You just browse. Yeah. What the banner says at least is that you are agreeing. 
So let me again observe that as somebody who was a practitioner for many years in uh, in Europe, I'm now 10 years at our think tank, but for many years I was the chief privacy officer at DoubleClick and AOL. The experience I've had dealing with European regulators was if I'm a little bit weaker here and I do a lot more over there, I'm sometimes, certainly with legitimate interest, but even in other cases, there's a implicit uh, well, you're not really de-identifying well enough, but look at all the other things that are happening here, and there ends up sometimes being a medium. Okay, let's squeeze in right here, and then... Well, uh, Gabriela will address legitimate interest in a few moments. It's a fully valid legal basis, and it was very important during the negotiations to the member states and to the organizations, to everybody, because it's this really this this uh, possibility to uh, to adjust a little bit. I would not be so skeptical about it, bearing in mind the accountability principle and necessity to prove how did I do my balancing. But again, I wouldn't like to step into Gabriella's expertise. I understand she researched a lot about it. The question which I would still like to um, underline, while speaking about the consent and contract, I think contract we more or less covered, are all this and very problematic cookie walls. How does it work? How does it, uh, what happens? Is it a valid consent? that actually I do not have any access to whatsoever if there is, if I do not click on yes. Now here in this respect, the position of the Commission, uh, of the European Commission was always that uh, the consent says what it says, the conditions are provided for in the GDPR are very clear, so the precise interpretation stays with the court. But let me draw your attention to some paragraphs of the guidelines on consent issued by, artic by now the board. So, um, here. The controller could argue that the organization offers data subjects genuine choice if they were able to choose between the service that includes consenting to the use of personal data for additional purposes on the one hand, and an equivalent, and it goes back also to your question, and an equivalent service offered by the same controller that does not involve consenting, uh, consenting to the data used for additional purposes on the other hand. As long, and here it's the important part, as long as there is a possibility to have the contract performed or the contracted service delivered by the controller without consenting to the other or additional using questions, this means that there is no longer an conditional service. However, both services need to be genuinely equivalent. It means that the core needs to be the same. It cannot be that the core of my service, when I give consent for something additional, and my core of my, oh, and my service, service only, because I didn't give here consent to anything additional, are not the same. So this is one thing. With cookie walls, the discussion is a little bit, oh, so if there is an option, I consent, and, uh, and I do not have to pay anything, and an option, that I pay something, reasonable fee, offered by the same controller, then it's a free consent. This is, an, uh, uh, this is something that is being very much discussed. But here, um, it's very much discussed within the e-privacy regulation uh, discussion. But here, for example, the, 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 the solutions are also different. Our parliament is saying, no, it's not free. The other parties are saying, in the moment, it does not include uh, pages financed by public administration where we all contribute, then it could work. The solution that I just ask the same controller offers quasi for consent, so, so this what we call all for free, which is actually never for free, 
and with a very small, uh, a very small price. And I think I leave it there. I am handing uh, to, to Gabriella for the. So the um, very controversial, I understand, uh, lawful ground for processing um, legitimate interests. Well. Uh, in all fairness, um, the uh, article itself of the GDPR talks about uh, uh, personal data being processed as necessary for the legitimate interest of the controller or even a third party. Um, but only as long as the rights of the individual do not overweigh the legitimate um, interests of the controller. And that last part of the provision is very, very important. Uh, you see here that we have technically a, a conflict, if we can uh, call it that way, between the legitimate interest of the controller or a third party, again, and that third party can be the uh, processor or literally uh, anyone, uh, even the society as a whole. Uh, and then, on the other side, we have the rights and freedoms of the individual, and in particular when that individual was a child. Um, this is important to note that the provision talks about rights and freedoms of the data subject, so not only the right to private life or to privacy or the right to data protection, it talks about the whole range of rights. We can include here, you know, freedom of expression, uh, right to property, all, the whole range of, of fundamental rights that need to be taken into account. Now, there are three conditions that must be met cumulatively for this lawful ground to be uh, acceptable. The first condition uh, is the existence of a legitimate interest. Um, the rule refers to any kind of legitimate interest pursued by the controller in any context. This is very wide. This can mean literally anything that is legal. Uh, and this is what makes this ground tricky to, to be lawful in practice. Because uh, you think that, oh, but it is in my legitimate interest to do this. Um, any, to do this any legal uh, you know, activity. However, the existence of the legitimate interest is just one part of this lawful ground. The second condition is that the personal data that you want to use for that legitimate interest must be necessary for that legitimate interest. And we go back to the shoe number uh, uh, example, shoe size uh, example. Um, so whatever data you're using and how you're using it, the processing of this personal data must be necessary to achieve that legitimate purpose. And uh, I'll go into an example or two afterwards uh, because perhaps it's easier to understand three examples. And then finally, and very importantly, there needs to be this balancing exercise. And we go back to the, always the case-by-case -case, um, you know, assessment that data protection usually requires. Uh, the balancing exercise must look at uh, the nature and source of the legitimate interest on one hand, so what kind of legitimate interest, whose legitimate interest uh, is that, and then the impact on the rights of the individuals on the other hand. Then a provisional balance is uh, looked at, um, and what the data protection authorities say is that safeguards can be brought uh, to rebalance that balance if, let's say, the rights of the individuals weigh more uh, initially. So data protection authorities say, well, uh, if, you, um, pro if you bring some technical safeguards, like let's say you encrypt the data or uh, you uh, come up with a very short uh, storage uh, retention period, or uh, you provide additional rights to the individuals that they would not normally have under legitimate interest. So for example, and this is an actual example given in the guidance uh, by the Article 29 Working Party, they say that if you provide data portability as a possibility uh, when you process data under legitimate interest, even though the regulation doesn't require you to do so, uh, then that's a safeguard that it's taken into account that you bring under your accountability to rebalance uh, that uh, um, exercise between the rights and freedoms of the data subject and the legitimate interest of the controller. Um, as Jules mentioned, we have this report with about 40 cases uh, from data protection authorities and uh, even some national courts 
uh, that, that is uh, available and uh, we will uh, send it in a package once uh, we have uh, the, the email addresses. Um, there are a couple of examples there. So I will give you, for instance, one example from France, because we were talking about Neil earl earlier. Um, th there was an online retailer in France that was selling products uh, over their website, uh, and they retained payment data for a longer than uh, just uh, completing the transaction. Uh, they retained it for uh, uh, some specific purposes, to facilitate later payments and to optimize business transactions. That was the specific purpose they, they mentioned. They um, justified the processing as follows. We initially uh, process payment data for the necessity to perform a contract. When someone buys something online, uh, obviously they have to pay for it, and we are processing that data. And then they said, we keep this data for another um, two years or so, perhaps longer, um, for facilitating later payments and optimizing business transactions, and that's in our legitimate interest. So that was their uh, argument. Uh, some customers complained to the French Data Protection Authority, and the French Data Protection Authority decided that um, retaining the banking details further than the transaction itself goes beyond the execution of, of the contract for the online sale, um, and cannot be grounded indeed on that contract ground. They said that uh, facilitating further transactions is a legitimate interest, and also optimizing business transactions uh, in the future, that's also a legitimate interest. So they found one of those three conditions to apply. However, the DPA said that given the sensitivity of banking data, of payment data, um, the right of the data subject to have the data deleted after being retained uh, for a period of time cannot be considered an adequate guarantee for uh, the rights and interests uh, of uh, the data subject. Uh, well, so the, the, the CNIL said that um, the personal data retained after the transaction must be subject to a number of safeguards and cannot be retained for a long period of, of time, and as such, um, on the basis of legitimate green interest. So, for instance, they actually gave some guidance in their decision, and they said that the credit card details um, must not have been stored in clear text uh, after the transaction took place, and in a single database, because this gave rise to a risk that the data would become accessible um, either through malicious employees or other external intrusions. So, in this particular situation, the Data Protection Authority um, decided that there is a legitimate interest, however, there were not sufficient safeguards put in place to uh, balance that balance exercise um, towards the controller in this case, because there were not sufficient uh, safeguards for um, individuals. Uh, there are a number of other examples. So, for instance, a, a German employer um, implemented keylogger uh, key software uh, to monitor how their employees are, uh, you know, working on their workstations. And the keylogger soft they use legitimate interest as their ground. Uh, but the courts in Germany found that while the company had a legitimate interest to do that and you know, see how efficient their employees are, uh, it was just too intrusive the way they put it uh, in, uh, in place because it, there were no limitations um, in time uh, or uh, it was just um, simply too intrusive. It would uh, record um, how long a time does a person has uh, between uh, when they type uh, on letters uh, and uh, so on. So you see the um, legitimate interest ground is not as easy to put in practice, but it's a completely valid ground to use. Yes. Yes, consequences are different. If you are, for example, you cannot base the same processing on several legal bases and say, like, oh, I will see how it works and I will choose the one. For example, 
um, if somebody withdraws the consent, then I can still process on the basis of legal, uh, of legitimate interest. I mean, uh, you see, because then you are not also, oh, there can be a, a situations that there is some overlap, in particular with legal obligations, but, uh, but a part of it, I wouldn't uh, say that it's possible, because then, you, I mean, the possibility for the data subject to control what you are doing, well, this whole regulation is actually about it. That individuals have to be able to control what you do. And when you multiply legal bases, then they're lost. And you'll see the privacy policies that you'll see updated must spell out, I'm doing these things, these things, these things, this is my basis, this is my basis, this is my basis, because that's the only way the data subject knows which rights they now have based on the particular, uh, yes? Uh, uh, the example you gave regarding the German case, it's an isolated case, but give an example, Google Analytics currently, they profile any type of activities that we carry out on the internet or whether it's an application on our phone, does that constitute a legitimate interest? It's, uh, well, it's funny you mentioned that because um, in the Google Spain case that we talked about earlier about the right to erasure, uh, the Court of Justice actually said that Google had a legitimate interest, an economic legitimate interest, to uh, keep all the data and make it accessible through the search engine. But that was about the search engine. It wasn't about monitoring. But again, take a look. You'll see Google spelled out much more specifically the exact steps that they use for analytics and for many of the other services now in more specificity so that publishers can be more careful about getting the appropriate basis for using those services, whether it's consent or whether it's legitimate interest. And uh, the court also said that um, the presumption in this case is always that the rights of the persons are uh, heavier, heavier than the legitimate interest of uh, the controller. Um, so that's, it's, it's, it was very interesting because they created this presumption from the outset that the rights of the persons are um, more, way more than the, leg the economic legitimate interest. So then you would have to come up with a lot of safeguards uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, but I know we have very little time uh, and we haven't talked almost at all uh, on substance about the rights of the data subject. Yeah. And the first Just ones, yeah. Before we are going to ra uh, rights of data subjects, I just wanted to uh, address one additional issue, vital interest, it's not so interesting, law, yeah. tasks. I mean, when you go to your uh, to, uh, you know, social authority and you want to get uh, uh, allowance for your uh, housing or for school, obvious, this is this letter E in the regulation, this is therefore, so that they can process your data in order to perform their, your task. Uh, this is what about. Now, and there you can object. Well, important thing is because very often businesses are saying, oh, well, I gathered all this data, it's very nice, what can I do with it? I was purpose bound, but can I do any further processing? And this is, the regulation does not prohibit, I mean, it's prohibited to have incompatible further processing. But what the regulation does, it's to clarify what is compatible further processing and where can it, it can be done. Conditions are provided for in Article 6.4. The clarification is never further processing, so using the data you gathered by the same controller, using the data gathered on the basis of a one, on one legal basis for a different purpose, it can never be done if the initial legal basis was consent or law. The law, and here I'm presenting you to recital 50, can specify different purposes and can itself already say what it's doing with that this uh, data which the controller is obliged to gather because of this and that legal obligation will be used also for this and that. But this is the law. Yeah? Consent is not a legal basis which allows you to process this data also for different purposes, even though you think that you maybe meet the conditions from 6.4. I think this is very important to say because businesses were, uh, were maybe uh, thinking about it. Contract, on the other hand, yes. This gives you some possibility, if you meet the conditions from 6.4, to further process the data. Oh, Gabe? Yeah, can I just ask you one question on that? Um, how do you distinguish between what is the initial purpose and what's the further per uh, processing? Well, what did you provide as an initial purpose? If you provided, I, I, so let's say my example, the, the dress, it's now, it's a contract, yeah? I, so I asked for the dress. 
or another, I order pizza. Yeah, I call you order pizza, I give you the thing. You are sending me advertisement for another pizzas, and you saying, because, oh, she likes Italian food, I'll send her also advertisement for the pasta menu, which I'm developing. On the basis of Article 6.4, it's more very probable than you didn't, I mean, all the marketing thing was not covered by the initial purpose of the contract, me buying pizza with you. This is what you would run on the basis of further processing. So, so what we put in the... The initial privacy notice. If we say we're we're collecting all this data, we're going to use it for all these different things. Well, it's what uh, I would not call privacy notice. Precisely the difference between 12, 13, 14, and the information necessary in order to have the consent, valid consent. But yes, the purpose which you indicated when you were asking me for my consent, when or purpose which you were indicating when you were signing contract with me, I deliver you pizza, Hawaii, uh, double size, whatever. Yeah? This is the thing. You are not saying to me that I will send you also the advertisement on the Italian drinks and, uh, and uh, the pasta menu I'm developing. Okay. Yeah? So this is very much about what, okay, I promise we're I We're going to wrap, so what, let's get the last key points and then we're going to get some coffee. Well, that's coffee. a very, <laughs> that's, no and no coffee. No coffee break. Lunch break. Oh, uh, it's okay. it's very heavy to talk about the last <laughs> points uh, so uh, quickly because uh, it, the last points are technically all the rights of the data subject. Um, just perhaps, uh, I mean, we could at least enumerate them. So, you know, the data subjects have the right to be informed about the processing. Uh, we talked a bit about transparency. They have the right to access their own data, and this is very important. So, their own data, and this is why it's important when someone asks for their own data from companies, that companies can somehow ascertain that that person is who they say they are, so you won't give the data of another one to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the person that is making the request. Uh, there's um, also right to rectification, so people can ask for their data to be rectified. There's a right to erasure, and this, of course, is one of the most uh, debated rights, the famous right to be forgotten uh, under uh, its other name. Um, it's important to highlight here that this right is not absolute, so exactly. uh, there are limited conditions under which a person can ask for their erasure, and it's uh, usually when the processing is not lawfully done, so when you don't have uh, the justification, the lawful ground for processing in place, they can ask for erasure. Uh, they can. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. So, and very important that it's not because this is what we very often hear, oh, you will kill freedom of expression in the EU. No, the, the regulation expressly provides for that this right to erasure does not apply if it's uh, necessary for the processing, for exercising of right of freedom of expression and information, if there is a legal obligation, public interest, and so on. So um, I, I think this is very important, Sweet. This is not the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten. It's not one to, you know, push the, for, 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 for the society to forget what, what happened. The balancing, of course, will be different, like in all balancing with freedom of expression and so on, and uh, freedom of expression and information will be always balanced depending on the position of the person uh, to, to whom it concerns, if it's a, a person of a, uh, from the public life and so on. Uh, they're, they're, they're the balancing uh, will be um, probably um, more to the disadvantage, to, yeah. to put it in a way, to the person claiming. If it's a, it's a, a politician, if it's an, um, a person of a public life, uh, it has, uh, uh, the, the, the society as such has more right to get information also on, 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 on different aspects of the life of such a person. Um, and, and another thing, very important, pending at the Court of Justice, question Google to judgment yeah. about the reach of the decisions of data protection authorities, European data protection authorities. What does it mean? If there is an, if a search engine gets an obligation to delist something, does it need to be done just in this member states, EU-wide, worldwide? This is just now pending at, in front of the, of the Court of Justice. I'm sorry, it's a Google 3 case. Google 3, yeah. because Google 2, it's about sensitive data. Google 3, it's precisely about the reach of the list. Uh, thank you for, for that. And uh, 
just to quickly go through the other rights, data, there is a right to data portability. This is new in the regulation. It overlaps a bit to the right of access, but it goes, more than, it goes beyond that because it also allows the individual to uh, ask for the, the controller to directly um, send the data to another controller. Uh, that's a part of it. Uh, it and and it's, it's, it, it's overlap, it has something of a right of access, but it's only More. data provided by the data subject on the basis of consent and contract. And very important, and of course, as you can imagine, the whole issue is about what the whole interpretation of what means data provided by. Consciously, actively, uh, observed, and here the guidelines are saying something the Commission had slightly different interpretation. Our Commissioner sent even a letter to Article 29 um, uh, wondering about the interpretation given about this data provided by. Yeah, indeed. So that's very important because portability only kicks in when the data was provided by the person to the controller. So that's why that interpretation and that debate is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There is a right to object. There is a slight mistake there on the slide uh, saying it's that consent. on consent. No, it's by tasks. Yeah. It's not by the consent because the consent can be withdrawn and automatically no legal basis for processing. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so there, there's like an absolute right to object when <laughs> consent is in place, if you want to call it that way. It's just the right to withdraw consent at any time with no justification. Whereas when the right to object kicks in. Uh, sometimes you need to justify why exactly. you... Exactly, on the basis of your individual uh, uh, situation. Exactly. Um, it goes a little bit further by direct marketing. And by direct marketing, you can always object with no justification. Uh, then there's restriction of processing. We won't go into that. It's a bit too, uh, technical. Uh, but what's very important, quickly, uh, the right not to be subject to um, impactful, solely automated decision making. This is very important because the authorities took the view that this right kicks in automatically with no request from the individual. It's actually a prohibition to um, engage in automated decision making, so based on algorithms. Uh, but there are some, so when it's solely based on uh, automated processing, so there is no human intervention, and when the potential impact is negative towards the individual. So when there is a negative effect or a legal effect, or uh, an important effect, not necessarily Well, I would negative. say because uh, with this negative effect, I have yeah. to be very careful yeah, because it was true. precisely what was discussed while yeah. at, uh, during the guidelines. What the Article uh, 22 says, it's legal effects or, or similarly significant. significantly yeah. affecting. It's true. Legal effects, it's something more, it's a legal effect, it's changing legal position of somebody. Yeah? What is this similarly significantly affecting? And here we are entering into the whole discussion, what is about targeted advertising? And there is a very important part in the guidelines on profiling addressing precisely this issue. I would not, the yeah, article 29 true. did not want to link it so much, I would agree that maybe this negative, but but it's not not always, not yeah. so restrictive because this affectance can be very different. And you will see that in the similarly significantly affected, it, there are different elements should be taken into account. But uh, I don't yeah. know whether we have, uh, um, we have still time. So we're out of time for this session, but each of these issues is tied together. So we're going to continue uh, iterating. Our, uh, we, we don't have a coffee break now. We are going to roll. It'll give you a minute to uh, stretch. Uh, Omer will come back. We're going to talk about sensitive data, about data protection impact assessments. Uh, we will then do some practical cases. We'll talk ed tech. We'll talk uh, data and cars uh, and some of those issues. So it'll be another example of us uh, to do this. So